together one time where the once was only her he gave his healing hand where the once was only pain he brought comfort like a friend I feel the sweetness of his love Piercing my darkness, I feel the bright and morning sun as he ushers in his joy. Read a scripture together with our brother Bissette. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Bissette Ntwari. I'm one of the worship team. I'm going to read with you a uh, book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. Let's read. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the sharing in meal including the Lord super and to pray 43 a deep sense of our camp over them all and the apostles performed the many miracles sign and wonders 44 and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had 45 they sold their property and and possession and shared the money and those in need. 46. They worship together in the temple each day, meet in home for the Lord's Supper, and share the meal with, uh, with great joy and generosity. Hallelujah. Amen. 47. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. I like the last sentence. And each day, the Lord had their fellowship 
those who were being saved. Let's shout hallelujah for together. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. God, you're so good. We give you praise, oh God. Your incorruptible word, oh God. I can't stay silent. I must sing for me. Joy has come. Let's sing that one more time. You turn. You turn my morning into dancing again. He's lifted my sorrows. I can't stay silent. I must sing for your joy. When our backs were against the wall And it looked as if it was over you Just a few more seconds, just another hand clap, come on, a few more seconds. Mighty God, we give you praise this morning, you're worthy of praise. Worthy of praise and honor and glory, oh God. Give you praise this morning. Amen, 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 amen. Lord God, thank you so much for being with us this morning, being with us during worship, oh God. 
it is beautiful to come together with our friends and our families and our loved ones and knowing that all over this nation, all over this world, that others are lifting up this name above all names. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. It is always wonderful to worship together. My name is Royce. I'm the worship pastor here. It is wonderful to worship together, to read scripture together, to clap our hands and sing together in awe and wonder of a king that is above all kings. We're going to get straight into it this morning. We are transitioning from one uh, sermon series to another, and we're going to have both of our pastors this morning ministering to us, as well as some testimonies coming to the stage. And so let's just do this right away. Let's go ahead, and as the band plays, let's go ahead and get out and meet one another, share someone your name, maybe give a short testimony how God made a way, and then we'll get right back to welcoming our pastors, Pat and Neely, for the word this morning. to be together. My name is Neely. Uh, I'm one of the co-lead pastors here at Overlake. Um, as Royce mentioned, this morning we're going to do a little tag team preaching. Uh, Pat and I will be teaching together. We are wrapping up our final week in our series um, that is called, Pat? Let's go! <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you know, someone's got to be excited around here, and we've got someone, so it's perfect. Uh, we decided, you know, in this particular season, it was important for us to do this particular work around our, our vision, our why, our how, our what, because as we head into this next season, we'll be really doing a lot of work around... Um, restore, rebuild, renovate. And those words come from Isaiah 58. We did a series in January where we talked about this work that we need to do as a church community to do restorative work around our history as a church, to rebuild the financial health of Overlake, and to renovate our 27 acres for the flourishing of our community. And we knew that this work was going to be hard, and it was going to be holy work, and it was going to require that or, or we knew potentially there would be moments where we would be like, wait, why are we doing this work again? Or, or how are we going to do this work? Or what are we doing? And so we were like, let's make sure everybody understands our why, our how, our what. Let's make sure we're all aligned. And so for the past few weeks, we've been walking through it. Week one, we talked about our why, which is our mission and our vision, which is simply this, that we are advancing the kingdom of God by seeing everyone, everywhere, experience and be transformed by the love of God. And here's the reality. Again, I gave a challenge the first week. I will do it again. Is find somebody, a staff, an elder, and say, show me the motions to this. I want to know how to memorize it. And again, if they are uncertain on how to do that, feel free to let me know. We want to make sure everyone knows how to do this. And so let's, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll do it. Um, and you can ask me and I'll, and I'll show you as well. So that's our why, really why. And then we say like how. Okay, we know why we're doing the work. But, but how do we want to do it? And from that we came, we came up with our belong values, which is really this, this commitment to the kind of people we want to be. And so our belong values, B is bravery. We talk a lot about this work will require Require us to take a risk. Yeah. Here's the deal. If we're not scared sometimes, we might be missing out on doing brave work. We want our work to be equitable. We want it to be that it, it's not someone with more power. It's shared leadership across the board. I love how beautiful Overlake is. And we want to see 
everyone's gifts honored and the shared vision and shared leadership across the board. And so it's equitable. L is learning. We are committed to learning. The reality is like if we as Christians feel like we arrive at a point where we don't need to learn anymore, that's when we start to really struggle. We should be learning all the way until the new kingdom comes. Like we should be continually learning. And then our O is ownership. I mean, you have to be willing to say, I own the mission. I own the vision. I own um, even my own growth, recognizing where I maybe made mistakes and I need to own those mistakes. Our N is nurturing that this is a community where we care for each other, where we celebrate together, where we, where we share each other's burdens. It's a nurturing relationship. And the G is gifting, that we celebrate and affirm everyone's gifts and we, we call those out and we invite them in. And and so this is really like when we talk about like how are we going to do this work, we're going to do it by belonging with one another and with each other and to Christ. And so this is our why and our how. Today we're going to talk about our what, which is our five G's. I'll let um, Pat start us in, the, in a moment. But before we do that, here's what I want to do. I would love for you to hear from an overlaker who lives out our why, how, and what. And I'd love for you just to hear his story and experience what it could look like for you here. So let me welcome Earl. Good morning, Overlake. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much to the uh, team for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, bear with me because I'm a little bit choked up. Every time I hear you made a way, it just, it just, Man, it hits me, and I just am so thankful to God for all the times he's made a way for me. <clears throat> so, I'm not up here to talk about me. I'm up here to talk about the children's ministry, and I've had the pleasure of serving the ch children's ministry for uh, several years now. And my journey with Overlake began way back in 2011 when my family and I moved here from the New York area. Um, I moved here for my job and uh, with my wife and my one and a half year old daughter. We didn't know anyone in the area. We had no idea what the Pacific Northwest was about. So we're kind of on our own trying to figure out, you know, life on the east side. Once we got settled in, I started looking for a church. And I grew up in very small churches of 30 to 40 people. And so that's kind of what I started targeting in the area. I visited a bunch of churches and I just didn't find the right fit for me and my family. Um, so. After I'd exhausted all those options, I did a Google search. Sorry, Microsofties. Um, <laughs> churches, you know, nearby me. And Overlay came up at the top of the list. And I looked at it, it looked huge. This giant building, the giant parking lot, and I thought, that's not for me. I'm a small church guy. But maybe I'll check it out. So this was back in 2011. So I came, and I was expecting just a sea of people. I thought I was just going to be a face in the crowd. Um, and I thought it was going to be kind of like a, you know, drive-through church. Um, and what I found was quite the opposite. I found a well-connected church um, that really had a heart and a soul for the people of this community. And I thought, well, maybe I'll give this a chance. So for a few weeks, I brought my daughter, and we sat up in the little, uh, I don't know what they're called, maybe family rooms, but I, I called it a crying room, where you can take your kids when they're small and they're screaming and you don't disrupt the whole service. And uh, really started to, to enjoy myself here. And I, I felt like this was the place God wanted us to be. Um, and so I eventually worked up the nerve to drop my daughter off um, in the nursery. And um, that worked out pretty well. So that became our routine. And we did that for a while. And then uh, she, you know, got a little bit older and she went into kindergarten. And uh, that was going great. And I kind of said, you know what, I should volunteer in the children's ministry because for years someone else has been volunteering for my child so I should pay it back a little bit. So I went in and you know it was fun chasing the little people around and you know reading them a Bible story and giving them some uh, goldfish snacks. You know, it was a lot of fun. But it wasn't until I, I kind of changed my mindset from volunteering to serving that uh, God really began to bless me. Um, you know just showing up to do your time is one thing, but contributing to the kingdom of God is just something completely different. And there are so many, so many blessings that I could share with you guys, but I'll, I'll focus on a couple. 
and I hope that, that these really resonate with you. The first is, when you serve and you contribute to the kingdom, there is nothing like it. For me, it gives me a sense of purpose and it gives me the ability to give back in the smallest way, just a tiny fraction of what God has given me and he's given me so much. And I can't tell you how fulfilling that makes me uh, feel that I'm able to give back and that it really humbles me that God would use someone like me um, with these children to plant seeds that, you know, Lord willing, one day they germinate and, you know, something beautiful comes out of them. So I just feel honored and humbled to be able to do that. The second thing is when I started to go into the children's ministry, I, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to miss out on all this great teaching, you know, that Pastor Neely and Pastor Pat provide every week and the awesome music and worship that Pastor Royce and the team provide us. And I have to say, I was, I was a little bit reluctant to let go of that because I enjoyed it so much. And I just thought, well, these little kid, you know, stories, Bible stories that they're telling them and the little worship songs with all the dancing and the hand motions, that's not going to really do anything for me as a Christian. I'm an adult. <laughs> How wrong I was. I, I can't tell you. Um, you know, I would go into these services and I'd show up to serve and I'd be struggling with something throughout the week and I'd hear a message and I'd sing songs that addressed exactly what was going on in my life. So I'm kind of looking over my shoulder going, do these guys know what's going on? You know, what, this, this is weird. But of course they didn't know, but God knows. And God will give you what you need, wherever you are, when you need it. He can find you. There's no place you can hide from God. And I, I found that to be very true um, in the children's ministry. And then finally, you know, kind of along the same theme, um, it, it's really reinforced to me that the word of God is the word of God. It can be delivered in a very eloquent, you know, way by the pastors here, and it could be delivered in a way that's intended for a kindergartner, but it's the same word and the truths are still the same. And so if you open yourself up to that in your, in your listening and your serving, um, you can benefit from it. So thank you, thank you so much Overlake for listening to my story. I just wanna give a little plug to the, uh, the children's team. Um, they said that uh, make sure you say there's a sign up table out there. <laughs> so if anyone is feeling the prompting, Anyone feels that gentle prompting, I, I highly encourage it. We'll show you what to do. If I can do it, anyone can do it. And we'd love to see your face there. So uh, thank you so much, Overlet. One, as a parent with two kids in Kid Town, I have to say just a huge thank you to you, Earl, the whole team, and just seeing just the investment made into my own family, and, and that's huge. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kid Town. Well, let's, let's do this. Let's, as, as really what Earl was saying there, let's, let's just go straight to Scripture as to really what is it that we're talking about here when we say the five Gs or the what, because really... When you have a vision and you have values, it has to look like something. The rubber hits the road and, and there's some way to describe what that looks like. And, and what those things are that we've just kind of given word to is what we call the five G's. And so here's what they are and we'll see how they show up in, in the book of Acts together. But the five G's is growing, gatherings, going, generations, and generosity. And in case you've just now joined us today, maybe it's your first time, welcome, perfect time to come. Essentially, two weeks ago we said, hey, our vision, our why, you can find that in the Gospels. Our how, our values, the culture, the DNA, you, you can find that in the epistles. Okay. If you want to see the what, read Acts. This is my favorite book of the Bible, without question. Read Acts and you'll see those five G's kind of expressed and espoused and kind of embodied in multiple different ways. And, and if you were to look at, at Overlake, how we have different ministries and you look at the org chart or the different teams or the staff or you look at the budget, you will see these five G's. And so what I want to do is I want to read the same passage that we heard during worship from Beseta. And it's out of Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. Again, this is just five, five little verses in a far larger book. But you kind of get the sense of, again, what the church looks like when it's living out on, on mission, the vision, and the values. So here we go. Acts 2, starting in verse 42. 
All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all as the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Again, you see kind of the the G's there. Uh, We'll start with that first one, just growing. I mean, there's individual growth happening as you kind of see that passage. Individuals becoming more like Jesus. And it's collective. You see a community of faith. You see this new spiritual family where Christ is at the center. And it too is growing. It too is maturing and looking collectively more and more like Christ. And you see numerical growth. You see people who are sharing their faith with their everyone everywhere. And you see that it's not just one day a week that's an opportunity to see growth as an individual or as a church family. Every day is an opportunity to be sharing the good news of Jesus with those in our lives. And you see the church living that out. And and in many ways, all the other Gs really have to do with growing. Uh, Second one, gatherings. Gatherings both large and small, you, you, again, in that same passage, you see the, the, it says all believers, they gather together in the temple daily. We, we don't gather daily. Um, we gather once a week. And, and I think there's some importance to recognize there is power in being together. Mm-hmm. There is power in being present with one another. And we see you online too. We're, we're glad that you join. We're grateful. And it's so good to be together. It, 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 it's no surprise when, when you start spending that much time with individuals, they become like family. Mm-hmm. And when they have need, it feels like your own need. Mm-hmm. For them to sacrifice, it, it, it made sense. These are quite literally their brothers and their sisters. And so what are, what are we to learn from that? Again, this is, acts as the blueprint. We're not trying to recreate the wheel here. This, this is it. This is the vision of what it looks mm-hmm. like. To spend time together, to to come early, to connect, to linger longer, to connect, to take those 30 seconds and and, 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 and not be so focused on maybe what you're going to say next, but just focus in on what that person's name is as you're meeting one another. And maybe going out to lunch afterwards, maybe going to Mariners games together, all, all of it, just spending time together. And then it says small gatherings as well. They're meeting in homes. They're, they're breaking bread. They're enjoying meals together. And, and, and that, that's what life at Overlake looks like as well. When we talk about groups, those are opportunities to be in smaller settings, whether it's in homes or elsewhere, to, to connect, to share life. It could be a support group for foster and adoptive parents, families. It could be uh, grow groups, connect groups, volleyball group. I mean, there's a lot of different forms and ways to begin flesh this out and live into this. In fact, this next series is called Becoming Human. We're really excited for it as a team. We'll start next week. It'll take six weeks long. And we are going to understand more deeply what it means when it says Jesus is the Son of Man, what, how that informs our own humanity, what, what it looks like for us to be more fully human. And we're going to be leading some grow groups that pa- parallel that, that, that exact series. So uh, both Neil and I, we're, we're leading some grow groups. I'm leading one for guys, 4.30 on Wednesdays over at Black Raven. Uh, opportunity, again, to connect, to grow. You don't need any prior knowledge. You don't need any, there's no homework. You could be a skeptic. You could come from any sorts of backgrounds. And we have guys who do. But the opportunity is just to read scripture, discuss it, and see what it looks like to begin to apply it to our lives. And then your, your yeah, group. Yeah, my, my group will not be meeting at Black Raven. My group will be meeting in my home on Wednesdays and it's for the ladies and we'll start um, not this coming week, but the following week after that. Our third G is going, which is local and global. And what is kind of amazing to imagine from this Acts passage is that these group of believers who gathered, this small group of believers, because they were committed to Jesus's words to go, you and I are here today. 
their gathering didn't just stay amongst them. They were committed to going, to, to the spreading of the gospel, both in their own community and around the world. And so we're here today. And so in the same way they had the commitment to go, we have the commitment to go both locally and globally. And that's what we do at Overlake. It's a long time been part of who we are at Overlake. Right now we focus on four areas of our going four focus areas around the world. And those things include the gospel. They include advocating for the displaced. They include um, refugees. I think that is the displaced. Why? I'm spacing. You tell me. Freedom. Four. Freedom. And peacemaking. Peacemaking. That's right. Those four are our initiatives, our areas where we go in those particular areas. And we say our commitment is to do that work here and around the world. I was asking Pastor Laura, I was saying, like, tell me a little bit about some of these areas. What are we seeing? And she shared a couple stories. She shared about work in Iraq where in a refugee camp, the, the gospel is being shared and heard, and they've started to gather and to talk about God's word together. She shared about Morocco, where there was a small work that started, which was caring for those with disabilities and families with disabilities. And this work began really small. And just this year, the government said, we see what you're doing, and we want you to open 15 more centers and do more of this work. And, and that's our commitment, is to continue to go. And at Overlake, we do going a couple ways. We do going with our dollars. We, we're committed to the cost that is the word going out. And so the first 10% that comes in to our general fund, we make sure that first 10% is about going, is about supporting the work around the world. Uh, it, it comes in, it goes out to the work. And then we also... We also go with our lives. We don't just send money and say, do the work, somebody. We, we commit to our lives being part of it. And actually, at the end of the service, we're going to commission a team of people who are um, headed to the border in Texas to work with one of our partners called Border Perspectives. And we'll commission them at the end of the service. So we go locally and globally. We do it here and around the world. And we do it with our dollars and we do it with our lives. Our fourth G is generations, which is a young and old or older or well-lived, however it makes you feel, you know, where depending on where you're at in there, how you want it to be said. But we believe the work is for every generation, that the formation of faith begins young and never ends. Mm -hmm. It begins young and never ends. Uh, maybe think about your own story. I, I think about our staff and when we talk about our stories and where did the formation, where did our faith journey begin? Most of us, it began when we were a student or a kid. And so we recognize the power of the gospel beginning in people's lives at a very young age. Jesus said we have to have faith like a child. So you know what? It's probably easiest to start teaching a child how to have faith like a child and let them lead us through this process. But we, we also think, so it's the formation of faith in individuals, but we also think it's the formation of the church in that the church, in order for us to outlive us, we have to invest in the next generation. We have to see the formation of future leaders in the church. And I want to tell you about Willa. Willa is a junior in high school, and she has begun to sense that God has put a call on her life. And what I love that's happening for her in student ministries is that she has a caring adult invest, investing in her, but she's also getting opportunities to test out her faith. In fact, this summer, you'll see uh, she, she got to teach in middle school ministry. Mm. She got to try out her calling. And she gets to do that in the safety of a ministry that supports her. Cool. And that's the reality is we, we believe that the formation of faith in the generations matters for the formation of the church, who we become, that we outlive ourselves. And... Here's the reality. We say that our vision is so that everyone everywhere experiences the love of God. When we do this work for students and for kids, do you know who experiences the love of God? Mm. Students and kids, but do you know who else? Parents. Mm. <laughs> I don't know anything more exhausting, harder, <laughs> more vulnerable mm. than parenting. And if you hear all the studies about what it's like to raise kids right now in the world, mm. 
mm. with anxiety and depression and social media and the pressure that is overwhelming, the amount of students who are dealing with mental health issues. And do you know who feels so alone in that? Parents. Mm. And so when we as a church say we're committed to the next generation, that we're going to show up for the next generation, even when it's messy, even when it's hard, even when it requires walking into conversations that maybe we don't want to have because they're so uncomfortable, we're willing to do it. Do you know who feels so loved and transformed by the love of God? Parents. And so our work really is for generations, for young and the well-lived, and we are committed to it. Jesus said, you, you know, be careful what you do to the little ones. And so we're careful. We care for the next generation. And we, we thank all the volunteers and student ministries and kid towns and teachers in our community for the work of caring for the generations. Our fifth and final G is generosity, which is calling and resources. So we say it's all of us. It's our entirety, right? It's, our, it's our, everything we own and all our skills and our whole entire life. And, and I'm, I'm mindful of even when I say everything we own, because as followers of Christ, we know that when we say what we own, what we really mean is what God has given us to steward. And so we're responsible because God has given us to steward it. And so we, we understand that it is a gift and we're to be generous with our life. In, in Acts, um, if you continue and you read it, you see this theme. Actually, you see this theme of generosity throughout the scripture, throughout the New Testament church. Um, I love, there's an interview with N.T. Wright where someone's asking him, well, can you show us where tithing shows up in the New Testament church? And he says, well, it doesn't show up because they don't tithe. They give their whole entire being to the church. Uh, all that they have is, belongs to the church. A little bit different mindset. So, but in Acts 4, verse 32, it says this, all the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own. Mm. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerly, powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There was no needy people among them. There was no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. In fact, this uh, past week, we sent out a letter with some updates in it. And we, what we want to do now is kind of just spend a little time talking about this letter. Um, if you didn't get one in the mail, you can swing by the Connection Center or the Serve the World table and you get a copy of it. But we'll also include it in our email this Thursday that comes out. But the words we've been talking about, the restore, the rebuild, the renovate, it comes from Isaiah 58. And this is what it says in Isaiah 58. Verse 12, the paraphrase, the message, it says, you'll be like a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. You'll use the old rubble of past lives to build anew, rebuild the foundations from out of your past. You'll be known as those who can fix anything, restore old ruins, rebuild and renovate, make the community livable again. And so we stepped into this work and we said, we're going to do work around our story, the restoration of our story. And that's the goal, is restoration. And what we believe is that restoration is going to call us to, invite us to, is truth-telling, confession, repentance, the work of reconciliation that leads to restoration. That it is going to be multiple steps. And we are inviting, we invited a group in called Grace to help us do this work, to kind of look at our story, to really dive into it. And it's going to be hard and it's going to be holy work, but we've invited them in and we're coming up on the next phases. The next phases of this work is approaching in which we'll be sharing, we'll be doing some truth telling, we'll be some, doing some confession, we'll be doing some repentance, we'll be doing some, what are the next steps? What is the recommendations that lead us to restoration. And so you'll, more communication is coming, so you'll just want to watch for that as well because we'll have a family meeting, but that date is yet to be determined. And then the other two R's, rebuild and then renovate. Rebuild has to do with financial health, rebuilding the financial health of Overlake. And so I'm going to take a couple minutes and just give some context, give a snapshot of kind of what the financial health of Overlake looks like. It's helpful to start, and I'll kind of break it down into parts, with debt. 
Since Overlake moved into this building, 1997, which is 26 years ago now, I did the math, <laughs> uh, Overlake has had debt that entire time. In fact, there was a couple years, a string of years, where Overlake would borrow against the equity of the building to just kind of sustain things as it was going. So on the outside, it looked like things maybe were going great when what you realize is you're just kicking the can kind of down the road and you're creating something that ultimately is unsustainable. And then couple of that with Overlake just having been really financially strapped and stressed. And, and so that looked like floating bill payments or not creating uh, ongoing cost of living adjustments for staff or, or just continuing kind of refinancing the mortgage. But after 26 years, instead of us being near to seeing the end of kind of this long journey of debt, we still owe, and I have the exact number here for us to see, $8,227,414.36. Yeah, a lot of people. I, I mean, I felt that in the room. A, a big, big, big number. Here's the thing. And I'm just going to, let's just leave that up there for a minute. I don't know. There could be someone at home right now just went into their online banking and you just want to <laughs> take care of it. Like, um, Please don't forget the 36 cents. <laughs> here, here's the thing. That, that is a massive number. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely is. And there have been far larger miracles that have happened throughout Scripture. Yeah. So what's massive to me is a molehill to the Lord. And we just happen to be in one of the richest places not in just the whole world, but in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. So this number really doesn't look that big to some people in our community. And we don't even know exactly maybe what the community looks like that maybe is in here or at home. It, it could be there is eight families that's like, you know what? We could take a piece of that pie. Like, and if that is the case, then we would love, we would, we would love to connect. But, but the reality is this number creates a cost to what it looks like just when it comes to kind of the X's and O's, the, the how ministry functions. It costs us over $600,000 a year just in debt service. That's a huge number. It's a huge weight of, of really kind of around us. And so that's debt. Now let's kind of look in the next category when it comes to giving. How, how are we doing? Where are we at right now? And, and, and currently, year to date, Overlake, you've been generous, incredibly generous. There's been over $1.5 million has been given to general fund giving. And, and again, Neely said, that's not just to make ministry happen here, but globally as well. So on behalf of not just the leadership at Overlake, but on behalf of all the partners we're supporting, thank you. Yeah. That is huge. That is huge. Yes, yeah. It's no small thing. You know, it's... As you kind of run and you look at projections and, you know, what if, you know, historically, what have things looked like? Currently, we're $37,000 behind where we anticipated or projected being at this point in the year. The budget that we passed that we affirmed as a congregation in January was for by the end of the year, $2.5 million worth of giving. So that means in the next 14 weeks, $1 million more is needed just to meet budget. That's not unlike most nonprofits. I, I know that sounds incredibly shocking. That's not only normal to Overlake or all churches, but really most nonprofits, 40% of donations really show up in that final quarter. And we're not unlike that. And that's exactly where we're at. So now let's talk expenses. Again, we're kind of breaking this down into pieces. Expenses, unlike income, well, those come consistently. <laughs> so that that mortgage, it's got to get paid every, every, every month. Like, there, there's a consistency to expenses. So think about this. That means over the course of the first 10 months of the year, you've had to pay 10 months worth of your budgeted expenses. And when it comes to income, you're waiting for those last couple months for the lion's share of those donations to post and come through. Here's what we know, is we know we're going to be over budget when it comes to really a lean budget, and in particular around operations. A key reason for that, and we've shared this earlier in the year, so some of this is just repeat for, for, for some, but the, the, a large, a key component of that was a $104,000 increase to property taxes. Now I know, you know, some are thinking like, wait, time out, like we're a re religious institution, you know, separation church and state, like what, what's going on? We have to pay taxes? Well, you get up to five acres that you can designate that's tax exempt. 
The other stuff you do pay property taxes on. What that means is this building covers almost five acres, the building plus a little bit of parking lot. That means the other 22 acres, again, to what Neely said, under our stewardship, under our care, we pay property taxes on. Mm -hmm. And those property taxes over the last three years have gone up 250%. And we know that they'll go up even more next year. We just got the assessment for next year as well. And so here's the note connected to this that also is important context to just realize. Thankfully, this building does generate a large amount of income when it comes through just rentals, what we're able to host indoors as well as parking lot rentals throughout the week. Uh, in, in fact, we will have more than what we budgeted for in that income, that rental income. It, it'll be around $800,000 this year. And so it covers a lot of operational expenses. It, it covers a lot. It doesn't cover 100%, but it does help incredibly. And so that's expenses. Now let's talk reserves. This is kind of, we're, we're, we're getting there. We're almost there, I promise. Uh, over the past two years, we've been able to create a reserves, establish a reserves fund, which historically Overlake actually hasn't had. And this year, we started January 1 with $700,000 in that reserve account. And now we have spent down to $265,000, meaning we've used over $400,000. Now, this is, again, where things start to connect. If we didn't have debt, we wouldn't have had to use reserves. In, in fact, we would have been able to give staff long overdue cost of living adjustments. And when we affirmed the budget, it did show that unless giving increased, we knew we would be leaning and using reserves to sustain current ministries and outreach. So needing reserves, that's actually not a surprise. It's also not sustainable, and that's not news to anyone. When it's gone, it's gone. And, and, and then this conversation is totally, totally different. But now again, e e expenses, again, they kind of arrive consistently throughout the year, and then income showing up later. And this can create a cash flow challenge, and, and that's what we're signaling. That's what we want to share with you now is between current giving current reserve levels, and a $121,000 tax payment due next month. The next 30 to 45 days are going to be extremely tight. And we've, we've shared this with staff, and, and, and there's awareness as well. But, but here's the thing. It's tight unless we respond. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's tight, yes, and we can do something about it, that, that, that we can respond. And, and not just with pledges, but quite literally with practicing what we preach and what we see in Scripture. And what we re realize is, yeah, we may be technically the co-lead pastors here. Jesus is the lead lead pastor. Scripture's <laughs> clear on that. He's the good shepherd. Je Jesus is the pastor of this church. We, too, are members of this church family. Mm -hmm. And we would never ask, we would never expect anyone do anything that we are not currently actively doing in our own families. And so when we give, we give first, the Swansons and McQueens. We, we, we do give first. We do give faithfully. We do tithe. We are responsive to when the Spirit asks, nudges, signals, it's time to make a sacrifice. We step into that. And we want to invite everyone to be sensitive to the Spirit. We want to invite all of us. Let's live into what it looks like to be the church in Acts. And so, again, two things. We need to retire debt. In a moment, I'll share board work that's occurring related to that. But then secondly, and this is work that only God can do. It's at a heart level. It's transformative in nature. It's, it's harder, deeper, is the work of transformation. It's, it's the work of what God does in individuals and in a community, falling in love with Jesus' vision. It's what you see in Acts. Whereas what Neely said, 100%, all believers, it says, were a part of the vision. No one was holding back. And not just with words, but with action. And not just in some areas of life, but in every area of life, including finances. And we do not despise even the smallest of gifts. Mm -hmm. Remember that story in scripture? Jesus takes a Lunchable and feeds the masses. Mm -hmm. Do not discredit even a small amount that maybe you're sensing the Spirit is inviting you to participate with. So if Overlake is your home, when we say let's go, if you want to be a part of what it looks like, 
The work that God's up to in our midst, in this church, this is a part of that invitation of, of again, let's go, responding to the Spirit. And when that happens, and what you see in Scripture, need evaporates. Mm -hmm. It disappears. It's gone. When everyone, again, this is where the book of Acts is amazing. You just see the church is so in tune with the Holy Spirit's leading and prompting. And you do. You see miracles breaking out and taking place. That's the work that we're invited into. So maybe someone or someone's or everyone, I don't know, is, is, is sitting there, is, is wondering, you know, okay, practical question. You know, what do I do? Or, or what's the best way to, to, to be helpful or have an impact? And, and, and the response to that question is to set up or increase reoccurring giving to the general fund. It, it has an immediate impact and it has an ongoing impact. And it helps address some of those other things that got brought up around, you know, cash flow and things of that nature. It makes uh, budgeting. It makes staffing. It makes being able to care for staff. Again, making those cost of living adjustments. It makes all those things possible. And then I said I'd mention the, the work around the board, around really that solution to debt. Uh, and if you're on your online banking page, don't worry about a thing that I'm saying right now. You just, you just finish what you're doing. But, <laughs> but here's what the board did back, back in April. And again, we shared this back in April. Is the, the, the board had listed the front acreage of our kind of plot of land here, long, narrow lot near, near Willows here for lease or for sale. Uh, the, the bad slash bummer news is it's not a great market. So opportunities are limited. The good news is there are opportunities. And each of those opportunities, it takes time to discern, to gain clarity, to ask questions, to understand impact, and, and then ultimately to bring to you. To bring to you. The, the, the way Overlake's bylaws are is that if there were a decision to sell even just a portion of land, it would require a congregational vote of members. Our bylaws define membership as someone who's a baptized follower of Jesus, who's actively living out everything we've talked about. Connection, what it looks like to participate in the life of the church, in, in, in serving, what, you, you know, what Earl was even sharing, but a way of using your gifts, of being a part of the ministry here, and then of giving as well. What we're addressing today, that is membership. And that, again, is why there was strategy and wisdom around doing this series in this season, not necessarily knowing timing or what next steps are, but inviting again everyone into let's go, let's be members, and let's be a part of what God's up to here. So that's all under rebuild. So restore, rebuild. Now let's share about renovate, which has to do with our place, 27 acres, 244,000 square feet, again, that God's entrusted to our care. And every bit of it matters. Every bit of it matters. Theology of place here is incre incredibly robust. And again, you can look at the January series for that. But we've sat down with the mayor. We've sat down with other community leaders. We've sat down with neighbors to ask them, what are the biggest needs in our community? Again, that's what you see in Acts. You see generosity is in a response to, it's an act of compassion, right? Essentially, in Isaiah's words, we're asking, what can we do to make this community livable again? In fact, just two weeks ago, or was it last? No, two weeks ago, uh, we, we got to go to a lunch with all the East Side mayors. And, and this was the topic. This was the conversation, is, is listening to the community. And, and so we, we go to these functions. We, we prioritize these things in our, in our schedules. And by far, kind of the three things that continued to surface was, one, the need for affordable early childhood learning centers and child care. Check. Overlake. That is being provided right now, mm -hmm. and it's incredible. And some of you get to be a part of it. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> uh, second, places of belonging, addressing loneliness, isolation, and polarization. Public officials are saying the polarization going on mm -hmm. is damaging communities. This is where the church gets to be healing. Not adding to it, but feeling a space of shalom. Check. Over like you're doing that. Third, and by far the biggest, and it's no surprise, it's in the front page of the paper every other day. Affordable housing, affordable housing, affordable housing. Washington is dead last out of 50 states. When you look at capacity, when you look at what's in the pipeline, it's a massive crisis, and it is getting worse. 
In January, we cast a vision for this, and we're serious. We, we've, Neely was sharing this past week. You know, uh, people are like, wait, are you, are you serious about that? Is that like really a thing? Is it kind of getting thrown out there? Hear us. <laughs> we are serious. This isn't a pipe dream. And we've been working hard on this. We've been working so hard on this. And we have two important updates on progress. One is great news. The other is an opportunity to pray, okay? <laughs> The great news is this. In July, the city drafted a housing policy that we have been persistently, patiently, and politely advocating for. This policy would make it possible for us to develop affordable housing on land that we either own or control, regardless of the fact that our zoning would not change. It would remain manufacturing park because the city is equally as committed to needing to protect it's zoning around manufacturing parks. So even though this has not been voted on or made official, I can't tell you how huge this is. I can't tell you how many people have said we wouldn't even make it this far and how many people are shocked that it even has gone this far. It truly is an answer to prayer. When we've invited you into seasons of prayer, we believe it shows up in moments like this. Here's the prayer point. Here's the prayer point. Everybody, right here. We got, we got prayer to do, okay? Here's the prayer point. We have a hurdle. Two, two weeks ago, we learned that voting this policy through city council, it was supposed to happen this November, not too far out, by the end of this year. Now they've signaled it's going to get punted into next year for a myriad of reasons, and they're all valid. So that's that. Here's what we, ha we have a meeting with the city this week and, and, and we love them and they do an amazing job and we are, we are friends. We, we, we know each other by first names. Here's the prayer for this week. And this is where I, I need like a recharge of hope. I, 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 to just be honest, there's been a lot of doubt. It'd be awesome if there was breakthrough, if there was any way, any way where the city were able to figure out a way that this particular passage is able to move quicker than the rest of the master plan that the city's working on called Redmond 2050. That'd be huge. Um, I can't say I'm expecting it right now in this moment. And that's again, I, th I think just prayer for favor over that conversation. Because here's the thing. And this is why we gave all the context and all the numbers and all the stuff. We don't have a year. Hmm. We don't have a year to wait around to see if this becomes official or not official. And the board, hear us, the board of elders feels the weight of the fact that everything we're talking about, discerning, discussing, praying about, these are generational decisions. Mm -hmm. These are decisions that impact far longer than our lives. Mm -hmm. We want to be thinking of the next generation and the generation after that and the generation after that. We want to center what are the needs among us. We want to be able to make decisions that we believe will just further communicate what God is up to in our midst, an opportunity to bear witness to heaven here on earth. And the board equally feels the weightiness of a sense of urgency equally feels the sense and the impact to so many lives. And so again, this is the invitation. Let's collectively respond to what God's up to and inviting mm -hmm. us into. So tell you what, a phrase that I hear constantly, whether it's among staff, overlakers, elders, is, man, what is God up to? Mm. What is God up to? Mm -hmm. What is happening? What are the opportunities here? Yeah, it's hard. This is scary stuff. I can't lie. And, whoa, what is God up to? Mm -hmm. And we don't want a single decision to be made out of fear or selfishness or anything else other than the clear directive of what the Holy Spirit is yeah. calling Overlake yeah. to do. Yeah. So please, please participate through prayer. Mm -hmm. Please participate through lifting us up. If you wake up in the middle of the night and somehow we come to mind or someone else in this church, that is a signal to pray for them. Mm -hmm. If there's a passage that comes to mind, and we had someone text us at 4 a.m. on an international flight with a passage, three psalms, 
And I, and I read it and I was overcome with, that's it. That's the word of the Lord for mm-hmm. such a time as this. Mm-hmm. Let's be open to the fact the spirit is moving and speaking mm-hmm. and to respond to it. Yeah. But we get to be a part of a church that again, when you read Acts, that's not 2000 year old stuff. That can happen today. Mm-hmm. That can happen today. Mm-hmm. And we all get to be a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Over the last year and a half, we've done these days of prayer, 27 days of prayer. And we want to invite you again to join us um, starting tomorrow with 27 days of prayer. And really, we're praying a lot about, you know, these big things happening that are really, as you listen to what we're talking about, we have a lot of really big moments in Overlake's history happening in the next few months. And so be praying for our elders, the wisdom and the clarity as we, as we navigate making decisions that are going to be generational. Be praying for hearts to be open as we meet with community members, as we meet with people who want to enter into partnership. Would you be praying for hearts, that hearts would be moved in a particular way? Uh, again, as Pat said, you know, what feels like a giant uh, uh, obstacle to us is nothing to God and how God moves and operates. And so we want to invite God to move in those particular ways and then jump in. Uh, we know that prayer changes us. And so as you pray for these 27 days, you might sense that God is calling you to step in in a particular way. And, and we want to encourage you to do that. So Join us for 27 days of prayer. We'll start Monday and we have a gathering on a Saturday where we come and we prayer walk around the building and we want to invite you to be a part of that. Last week we walked through with our staff. We kind of talked about what was uh, what what we're talking about today. We we did the same thing as walk through our why and our how and our what together. And what I really felt this moment is like, I think our why and our how and our what, they sound really great. They actually look really great on walls. Um, They got catchy phrases. They look really good. But the invitation isn't just to look at them. It's to live them. Mm. The invitation is like, they're kind of meaningless if we don't step into them. I think about how, you know, there are moments where I sense God's inspiration, like God is inspiring us. What could be? When you really think about shalom, when you really think about flourishing, when you really think about seeing what happened in Acts 2 happening right here in Redmond, Washington, it is inspiring. But it can't just be inspiring so we feel good. It's inspiration that moves us, that that takes our feet into action that moves us from people who are inspired to people who are like getting our hands dirty in the work. We want something, we've got to live something. And I think that's the invitation where we're at in this moment when we're thinking about, we we have to step into it. Again, it, it looks good, but man, imagine if we lived it if we really stepped into it. To be a part of shalom is to be a part of something that is beautiful, that is whole, that is good, that is healing. And we get to be a part of that, that God is inviting us to be a part of it. And we believe it's something that requires all of us. It it requires every one of us. It's us making it personal. That's why we have magnets in the hallway that we each pick who is our everyone everywhere. Who are the people that God is calling us to? We, we fill those out and then we take them home. You know, it, it, it requires all of us taking steps to join and be a part of the work. And so it makes the most sense to make our response time today practical. And so here's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you to grab your phone, go ahead and pull your phone out. And uh, I'm gonna have you scan that QR code behind me. And here's the deal. I know some of you are like, Neely, you made us do this two weeks ago. I just did it. It's true. I'm going to ask you to do it again. Uh, I am going to ask you to do it one more time. Um, So if you could go ahead and pull out your phone and scan that QR code, we'll just take a moment together to, to think about what are some potential next steps for me, for each of us. We'll do it together. If it's your first time, we would love to meet you. We have a little gift for you. We would, we want to invite you into this beautiful community of what God's doing. You'll, know, you'll notice in particular there are next steps for this series, for Let's Go. It's committing your life to Jesus. It's, it's saying, you know what, I want to be a part of the family. I want to be 
living out God's kingdom. I want to be a part. And so you commit your life to Jesus and we'll follow up with you and we'll, we'll walk with you in that journey. Or maybe it's joining a group. There are a lot of groups happening. This is a great next step. Or maybe it's serving. Maybe it's time to take that next step and, and serve and help create a place of belonging for others. Maybe it's about setting up giving or, you know, figuring out how to do that. Or you maybe have questions about, you've heard about matching and we can make that possible. And you want, you want to talk to someone about that. Or you want to join in the 27 days of prayer. You can just click that. And here's what our commitment is, is that together, together, every one of us, we get to do the work of seeing everyone everywhere experience and be transformed by the love of God together. We get to do that together. And so would you join me in prayer? Jesus, we thank you for shalom, for flourishing, for your kingdom, what it can look like, that we don't have to wait until this next life to see your goodness. We get to see it here. And God, would we join in that work? Would we take steps to join in that work? God, move us from not just seeing something, seeing some words, but living these words, God. Move us from not just being inspired in our hearts and feeling good about it, but God, move us to inspiration that leads to action, God. We want to see your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Neely. I realize we're going a little long today, but I, we do want to commission our team um, heading to the South Texas border. So if you guys want to come on up, well, yes. So we just want to remind everyone as they're coming up, if you need prayer this morning at all, we have people that would love to pray with you. Find somebody with um, a little button. Um, they will be outside at the Connection Center as well. Come up, everyone. Look, you all have matching t-shirts. I love it. That's awesome. That's great. So this team um, has been preparing for months now, and they are ready to go. They have been open to what the Spirit um, wants to do in their lives, and I'm just so proud of them. And they're going to be heading down to uh, the border to help um, to learn and to to hear the story of the migrant journey as well as um, just to help out in practical ways. And what I what makes this team so special is I think 90% of the team are Spanish speaking um, and coming from five different countries, I think, originally. So yeah. I love it. This is Overlake, guys. This is Overlake. Um, yeah, so we just want to send them out with a great Overlake uh, commissioning. So if you guys all just want to stand up and if you feel comfortable, you can extend your hand out. Let's just pray a blessing over them as, as they head out uh, this Friday. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this team, for these individuals who have given their lives to you and to your service. Lord, that they are modeling the going that, that we talk about here at Overlake. Lord, we just pray your abundant blessings over them. Pray for your protection over them. Give them courage, strength. Give them wisdom. I pray for God opportunities to, to happen um, during their time there, Lord, that opportunities that can only happen because of you. Lord, may your love just radiate from within each and every single one of them yes. as they come into contact with, with people there. And Lord, um, Yes, Lord, we just thank you. And we are expectant for what you're going to do through each and every single one of them. Lord, we send them out um, with your blessing. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yes. So, you guys can go ahead and go off. But um, we do have service learning trips that happen um, throughout the year. So come and find me anytime if you ever think that this is an opportunity you'd love to be a part of. And as you head out today, uh, stop by the tables if you want to join a group or a team. There are people there that would be happy to speak with you. And so have a good week over Lake. Goodbye. <laughs>